And um, I'd like to move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Piotr Gorodinsky, who is uh, the director of NCI, Alliance for Nanotechnology in Cancer, Center of Strategic <coughs> Scientific Initiative in the National Cancer Institute. How do I do this? Like this? Okay. Well, good afternoon. So I will continue this uh, philosophical discussion. Uh, due to the speakers in the morning, I felt compelled to introduce some Latin into my title. Even uh, my Latin is really not existent. But uh, I think for us um, at NCI, obviously, um, you know, what, what's the growing potential of this field and also where this field will be going and what are the best possible applications for it is critically important because we, ultimately we are paying for it at least, uh, at least partially. So um, I probably will summarize a lot of things which you already heard, but hopefully I will add a few, few additional things. So again, for somebody like me coming from engineering to this field many years ago, I think what is really always important is to see why we are doing it. And ultimately, if you look at the impact of cancer, both in the US and worldwide, is, is incredible, both from emotional standpoint as well as uh, a health standpoint, and ultimately the uh, <clears throat> budget impact on the healthcare. So in the US, in the US only, about 600,000 people die from, the, from cancer every year. There is 1.6 million people who are um, diagnosed with cancer every year, and that results in the cost of $160 billion. Uh, because uh, most of the cancers occur at the later age, because of increase of the life expectancy in the US and worldwide, obviously number of cancer cases in the world be, will be increasing. But I think what is good to know, uh, and these are only statistics for the US, the number of people who survive cancer and can live with cancer uh, whether they are under treatment or, or cured, it is uh, increasing. It was 7 million cancer survivors in the U.S. in 92, and now it will be 18 million in five years from now. So to respond to opportunity for nanotechnology, we started the program which we call NCI Alliance for Nanotechnology Cancer uh, over 10 years ago, and the purpose of this is to fund academic research and do applied research in university labs, but at the same time to put a very strong uh, <coughs> translational uh, spin on it uh, and uh, <coughs> basically commit people in academia to try to translate these new technologies and commercialize these new technologies. And most of that is happening by uh, small startup companies, and some of them are not, any small, not that small anymore, which are being uh, resulting from, uh, from the work in academia. So I think, again, I, I want to stress this aspect of, of looking for compelling and unique opportunities where nanotechnology can play a significant role and may not have a lot of other techniques which, which it needs to compete with. Uh, this uh, data from the paper which was published in Belgium a few years ago, which tries to look at number of citations for publications which use nanomedicine for cancer treatment as a function of different uh, tumor indications. And what is, I think, important, if you look at the table at the bottom mm, left, that most of the citations occur for the uh, tumors which are hard to treat and have poor survival rates, and you can correlate that with the, table, with the graph on the right-hand side, and these are brain, pancreatic, ovarian, and lung. <coughs> um, of course, historically, a lot of work, uh, and you heard many talks about that in the morning, uh, is still related to liposomes, but there are new generations of different uh, nanoparticles which are being developed. I borrowed this graph from uh, Omid Farozat's uh, publication few years ago. We also heard there's few new approvals in last few years, Markibo in 2012, Onivite, which came out from Merrimack, and you heard about that uh, from Daryl Drummond earlier. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so it seems like the uh, pipeline is continuously being, being fed. Now, in terms of the <coughs> different approaches and different areas, and again, a lot of that was already discussed before, of course, you start from simple, and then you, you move to more and more complicated. Uh, uh, so, of course, delivery of small molecules using passive targeting, where, um, and you heard about DPR a lot already, 
uh, that is most mature uh, and uh, a lot of that uh, is related to the delivery of uh, approved and existing uh, treatments. Many of uh, those are in clinical trials. Many of them have been already approved uh, for use. <clears throat> I think what is important and maybe it doesn't happen as much as we would like is looking also as the uh, molecules which are potentially very potent uh, but uh, cannot be delivered in free form because of their high toxicity. Question is, can you reformulate them using nanoparticles and open their therapeutic index? And I think that can potentially uh, <clears throat> introduce something which with more impact than uh, delivering uh, the molecules which have been approved. Yet, it has happened to some extent, but probably not enough. Uh, the other area which uh, initiated several five, six years ago, uh, <clears throat> there was first paper uh, about uh, <clears throat> delivery of siRNA using nanoparticles in human. Uh, that is moving, but somewhat uh, slowly. Uh, we heard a lot about targeting and pros and cons of it, so I'm not going to repeat that. Two things which we didn't talk about much, or at least I didn't hear much about it today. One is using the particle inherently for the therapy itself without really uh, bringing uh, the cargo <coughs> drug molecule with it. And of course, hyperthermia uh, falls into this category. Uh, mm, question is how much, how much can be done there and how, uh, how practical and useful that would be. Uh, there is one treatment uh, uh, commercialized by the company Mark Force in Germany uh, for local uh, treatment of uh, glioblastoma. Uh, I think that that is in a way more elegant because simply you are using nanoparticle native uh, uh, capabilities for the treatment. And the other with emerging importance of immunotherapy, of course, question is what nanoparticles can do there. And it seems they can do a lot in order, in, in addition to just uh, being delivery vehicle, uh, there is uh, a lot of relevant possibilities for co-delivery of number of different sets of antigens, co-delivery of uh, antigens and adjuvants, uh, building artificial antigen presenting cells, uh, as well as uh, uh, driving or uh, stimulating tumor uh, microenvironment uh, to, <coughs> to boost the T-cell activity. So, of course, again, looking at pros and cons, I think that the important successes in the last uh, few years is the onivide approval and also successful phase three trial for Cellator uh, treatment for leukemia. We didn't talk about that earlier. It's a combination therapy and again was elegantly studied uh, when a uh, combination of two different drugs and the most efficacy uh, there was for uh, the ratio of five to one, which is different from the standard practice before this drug uh, uh, was, uh, was tested. <clears throat> and to Cellator's credit, it was acquired by Just Pharmaceuticals for $1.4 billion after this phase three uh, clinical trial ended. There were some setbacks as well. You heard about that earlier. Uh, Bind got uh, acquired by Pfizer, and Pfizer is driving some of, uh, some of this work uh, forward. So we try to, since we are spending a fair amount of money on it, we're trying to bring a lot of people into these discussions, uh, similar to the one which we are having here, uh, uh, to NCI in Bethesda. Uh, and uh, the <coughs> set of priorities here, which in a way reflect some of the things which I already mentioned earlier, which I think are important, is really look more carefully and maybe more broadly to the uh, rescue of the molecules which failed in trials in, in free format delivery uh, and uh, looking more at combination therapies where the metering of two different or more uh, drugs in one uh, uh, nanoparticle package can be, can be successful. Immunotherapies are creating a good opportunity and again <clears throat> opening the therapies to undragable targets which could not be uh, treated without uh, uh, mm, nanoparticle approach. But I think what is also important, and that came across to some extent, is looking really at the fundamentals. There's still a lot of things which we don't understand or we don't understand well enough. Uh, one is uh, the heterogeneity of EPR effect or whatever we will call it in the future. Uh, the other one is trafficking of nanoparticles after they are being uptaken to the, uh, to the cell. 
uh, and enabling an uh, effective uh, endosomal escape, and looking at the tumors which are hard to treat, which are surrounded by significant biological barriers, for instance, uh, crossing blood-brain barrier or penetrating stroma in uh, pancreatic cancer. We wrote a paper about a few of these suggestions uh, two and a half years ago. And of course, another thing which we really didn't talk much about here is diagnostics. Of course, uh, imaging is only one component of that, but there is another aspect of building nano devices which can work in in vitro space. And there has been quite a bit of work in, the, in that area. Uh, and essentially, the advantage of these devices is that uh, they can be highly multiplexed. Uh, they can look at a number of uh, <clears throat> biological signatures at the same time, whether it's genomic or proteomic signature. Uh, they also uh, can be used to uh, concentrate the targets which occur at low uh, concentrations. Um, and another spin on that is using nanoparticles or some kind of nano. Uh, uh, technique for image-guided uh, surgery, and we heard the talk about that earlier. So just to show you a few examples uh, from these new emerging opportunities, uh, this is the reformulation uh, uh, of uh, <clears throat> SN38, which is active metabolite of urinotican. It's much more potent, but uh, it cannot be delivered well otherwise. And you see that uh, when you package it into nanoparticles, uh, it, it acts much more uh, potently. Um, and again, this is just one of the examples, but I think following this train of thought and looking at some of the molecules which failed trials can be, can be potent. You may hear more of that uh, from Scott McNeil, who will talk uh, uh, after me. Uh, we also have now a small program on reformulating natural products uh, from our division of cancer therapy within NCI. Um, some clever ideas in more of niche applications. Uh, <clears throat> photodynamic therapy, or PDT, is the treatment which uh, uses light to uh, induce photosynthesizer to release reactive ox oxygen, which uh, uh, kills uh, tumor cells. But of course, that can be only used for superficial tumors because light doesn't penetrate the tissue as effectively. So there are people who are thinking right now about uh, possibility of developing deep tissue PDT by generating internal light sources. And that's, I think, pretty clever work from uh, Washington University and group of Sama Chiliefu, where he uh, <coughs> delivers two different families of nanoparticles. Uh, one are be, uh, one uh, is radiolabeled FDG, which uh, emits uh, positrons and they penetrate through the tissue and create uh, the so-called Cherenkov effect, uh, which is emission of the light, uh, which uh, uh, where uh, the particle uh, penetrates uh, through the media at uh, speed higher than, than light. And in turn, that uh, Cherenkov light is used uh, to activate other set of particles uh, which generate the radicals needed for the treatment. So uh, again, it seems very effective. Question is how far would that uh, go and how can, can that be used for the tumors which are uh, deeper uh, in the body? Uh, in terms of <clears throat> immunotherapy, as I said, there is a number of opportunities there, and some of them are already being exercised, where you are basically trying to use nanoparticles for co-delivery of several different antigens, uh, co-delivery of antigen and the adjuvant, uh, <clears throat> Uh, use even nanoparticles for harvesting antigens which have been released uh, after the uh, companion treatment, uh, and again uh, using uh, um, nanoparticles to co-deliver immunostimulatory molecules uh, to stimulate uh, local tumor microenvironment. Um, and that's the example of the work where you use particles to harvest uh, <clears throat> the antigens these antigens are being released from the tumor cells after initial treatment of radiotherapy, and then uh, different nanoparticles, depending on their uh, surface functionalization, will uh, collect uh, some, of, uh, some of the antigens more effectively than the others, and they, were, uh, they used combinatorial methods to, uh, to evaluate that. That's uh, work from Andrew Wang uh, at UNC. And eventually, these particles are expected to be uptaken by 
uh, dendritic cells and, and uh, perform the uh, <coughs> presentation of uh, antigen and activation of uh, T cells. Now looking at this other space, which uh, we haven't heard much about uh, in terms of the uh, diagnostic aspect or using nano devices for, uh, for in vitro diagnostics or liquid biopsy, advantage there is that in, in addition to multifunctional capabilities when you can look at number of different signatures you can also look at genom genomic and proteomic signatures at the same time the sensitivity of these methodologies is about three to four orders of magnitude better than traditional ELISA uh, assays and usually they can operate in point of care uh, structures so the, uh, uh, the turnaround to get the results is much, uh, much faster than sending the sample to the, uh, to the lab for analysis and waiting so, a couple of days for that. Um, and I think uh, there is a number of platforms which have been established and they are fairly robust. I think the issue, uh, that, so the next question uh, um, where these devices are being used is to look at the wide range of different signatures and minimizing the, uh, the signature to the particular tumor to make the early diagnosis or, or they can be also used for monitoring of the effectiveness of the treatment to the uh, <clears throat> minimum subsets of biomarkers and, uh, and using that as a, as a test. Uh, and following on that, there is a number of different platforms uh, which use different tra transduction methodologies um, and uh, they can be based on electronics, optics, electrochemistry, uh, and magnetisms. And of course, emerging or parallel to that is the concept of liquid biopsy when you are trying to, trying to capture circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA. And that, again, can be used for, so far, mostly tracking of the effectiveness of the treatment, uh, but also probably can bring some uh, good information into understanding of metastasis. We heard earlier about uh, uh, monitoring of the tumor margins during the real-time uh, monitoring of the surgery. That's an example from, and I think this paper was already referred to, its work of Michelle Bradbury at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, they developed uh, <coughs> silica particles which have encapsulated uh, fluorescent dye. Uh, they do use fluorescent dyes of different colors. They target them and basically they delineate uh, lymph nodes uh, uh, which uh, participate in met metastasis and in parallel they are also looking at uh, labeling and delineating of nerves in the proximity so during the surgery you are not only make sure that you don't have positive margins on uh, on the tumor but also that you don't damage the the nerves uh, during the procedure and of course the important thing about uh, these in vitro uh, uh, tests is putting them in, into perspective, and I think this very clever paper from Sam Gambier at Stanford, which shows uh, what are the, or what are, how high are requirements on the biomarkers in order to <coughs> detect the tumors through uh, in vitro uh, blood test. And again, depending on uh, how specific biomarker is, it may uh, take, if you detect the biomarker uh, in the blood that may mean that tumor has been growing uh, uh, in the uh, patient's body already for 10 years. If you make this uh, biomarker much more specific, it, uh, it will improve that to, to only a few years. Uh, but of course, uh, what that takes you to, that maybe it's better to look at the tumor closer to the tumor and developing the approach which works in vivo and uh, this, uh, I think, clever example from uh, Sangita Bhatia's lab at MIT, who combined the in vivo detection with in vitro evaluation of it, and she built particles which have a linker, and this linker gets uh, cut off from the uh, particle construct by uh, <coughs> enzyme in tumor microenvironment, and then the reporter is being released through urine and can be uh, can tested uh, in in vitro space with high uh, sensitivity. Uh, but I, again, I think this is the area where, uh, where uh, we, we should spend some time thinking about uh, compelling applications. So that uh, brings me to the list of questions. I don't have answers to that, but I think uh, as previous speakers 
uh, this more to stimulate thinking uh, in the community. And I think the one issue, regardless of how well or not EPR works, uh, is that uh, if you look at the, the uh, nano medicines which have been approved, uh, uh, or many of them which are in clinical trials, they significantly reduce side effects. However, uh, they have only modest, at best, uh, improvement in uh, survival rates in the patient. So question is what, uh, what we can do that and uh, if some of the stratification methodologies of the patients which we heard about uh, can make a difference there. Uh, again, and the, the, this conference is the best reflection to, of that is that uh, the focus of nanomedicine, at least in cancer space, uh, is maintained on therapeutics. Question is, should we open it uh, and spend more time on looking at uh, diagnostics and would, uh, would that uh, uh, you know, provide us with some of the more uh, compelling uh, applications? And again, I think uh, what is important here, combining these uh, two bullets at the bottom, uh, that uh, in a way, I think we, we need to start the technology development from defining the end goal application, and that requires a lot of conversation with uh, clinical community, because then hopefully you can define uh, the application which will not have a lot of com contemporary uh, competition from, from other approaches, and, and uh, what nanotechnology brings to the table will be hopefully uh, unique. <clears throat> and again, that, that was discussed already many times, uh, aspect of heterogeneity of, of EPR effect, not only among patients, but also among uh, different tumors. We had a conversation about that at NCI uh, four years ago, and as you see, we still have these conversations here about. Uh, so that uh, question is how, how and when some systematic study on that can be, can be done and hopefully produce some, uh, some answers. Uh, you are also heard about uh, assessing EPR heterogeneity in, in different patients. Uh, that's uh, from a recent uh, uh, Omid Farozat's paper, and that uh, also uh, <clears throat> over, overlays very well with uh, what we heard from uh, Daryl Drummond. Uh, Mary Mag is actually using this technique uh, already in, in patients. Uh, so again, that, that potentially could, uh, could identify people who uh, will have a uh, high probability of uh, responding to the, to the treatment. And of course, when, and that was mentioned also at the beginning, uh, when drug come, gets to the tumor, uh, that's not only end of the story. Now, uh, understanding how much of this drug is actually active uh, and how that ties to efficacy is mm, equally or even more important. And again, that's the slide uh, which I borrowed from uh, uh, Scott and uh, NCL, Steve Stern developed some uh, uh, pretty clever methods to, to evaluate that. <clears throat> we tried to pull these thoughts together and at NCI we published something uh, called Cancer Nanotechnology Plan. Every five years you can find it on our website. Um, I think uh, uh, the testimony to growing field is that this book is getting sicker every year and it has more uh, more different uh, potential areas of interest. Uh, <clears throat> in addition to funding research, we also have uh, some capabilities which hopefully help to translate it. Uh, you will hear the talk uh, from Scott McNeil on NCL, which has uh, tremendous success in terms of looking at different nanomaterials and evaluating them and contributing this data to follow up uh, applications to FDA. We're also trying to link with not only small companies, but also large pharma, trying to understand their roadmap and how, uh, how actively or not they are involved in, uh, in nano nanomedicine work. And that's uh, the fairly complete list of companies which have been started as a result of academic research which was funded by us. You see that the list is long. Of course, many of these companies are very small, but some of them grew to <clears throat> significant sizes and uh, many of them are involved in clinical trials. So I think as with any new technology, uh, on one hand we should be critical, but on the other hand we should be optimistic and then the new technology goes through the saturation uh, <clears throat> and then hopefully find uh, inflection point and continue growing farther. 
uh, I think it's up to us to define what will create this inflection point and take the field uh, to the next step. And of course, one comparison and uh, comparison with monoclonal antibody treatments have been already made earlier. Uh, it seems that it takes for a new technology about 20 years to go from early research to significant uh, clinical impact. That's uh, shown in the uh, graph on the right-hand side. Uh, on the other hand, on the left, we show uh, the increase of rate of publications on nanotechnology-based uh, PubMed publications. And as you see, within 15 years, we went to about 20,000. And I think what is a good thing is that number of these papers is saturating and probably some of these fundamentals and in-depth studies which, uh, which I've been talking about uh, are now taking more time which, and that probably results in publishing uh, less papers. You have Clean Cleanum here, which I certainly enjoy to, uh, to be part of. We also uh, started a conference on cancer nanotechnology, more specifically not on nanomedicine in general. That's part of Gordon Research Conference series, and next meeting will be in June 2017. Uh, we meet in Vermont, so it's a good, uh, good spot in that uh, part of the year. It's much cooler there in, than in Washington, for example. <clears throat> part of the, and I'm running out of time here, uh, I just want to show you two slides to close. Uh, recently, former uh, Vice President uh, Joe Biden uh, uh, started an initiative called Cancer Moonshot, which uh, basically wants to focus on maybe not doing more research on cancer, but uh, trying to do it in a different way and removing some of the stove uh, <coughs> uh, pipes, which, uh, which obviously exist uh, like in any discipline. And that recently uh, got approved by, uh, and it's called 21st Century uh, Cures Act, uh, and that will dedicate about $300 million extra uh, to NCI budget, and uh, it has a number of uh, uh, focus areas, um, <clears throat> and we are participating, obviously, actively in these discussions. So I will stop here. These are people who work with me at NCI and help uh, a lot in developing new programs, and I will be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you.